we are back with an episode of the podcast was on fire and it wasn't my fault oh we read along pod we dig into the good the great and the problematic of the dresden files series by jim butcher a long time dresden aficionado and this is my very first time reading through and together we spend an hour talking about wwe and then hit the <laughs> To bring you the podcasty goodness that is the Dresden Files series. Woo-hoo. How you doing today, guys? Hanging in there. Got a bit of a migraine, but working on it. Oh yeah. Well, hope it goes away before the plane comes. Cause you Me too. Are, hit- are hitting the bricks, huh? Uh huh. I decided to fly this time rather than drive because I'm not friends with blood clots. <laughs> if you get to know blood clots better, you come to appreciate. What, what they mean. What, you really do. Them, you really are. do. I've been on blood thinners for three weeks now, and I'm bruising so easily. <laughs> I have a bruise on my butt from trying to reorganize my craft room. I have a bruise on my butt from running into things. Oh, I have little tiny bruises all over my legs, and I have no idea where they came from. Keep hitting things, running into things. Well, we, so we've mentioned this on the pod multiple times, but the uh, we call it a game, for lack of a better term. <laughs> when someone is acting like someone else in our family, we'll call them by their first name, mm-hmm. the other person's middle name. Yep. So my father's name was Edward Cotter. <laughs> the entire path, pantheon of gods, rest his soul. And a very, very common refrain, refrain around these parts of our family is Alyssa Cotter. <laughs> for, a, for a multitude of reasons, but this is just another one. He he also was on blood thinners and would just have random bruises all over the place. Yep. So, yep. Alyssa yep. Connor. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I'm a klutz on my own. Yes, 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 she is. I have random bruises without blood thinners. So. <laughs> He's just purple. I was joking around to mom. I was like, maybe I just need to be in a bubble. <laughs> she agreed. <laughs> Today we have chapters 34 through 41. We are ramping up and knocking on the door of the climax for turn coat. What'd you think about this chunk? It was good. Mm-hmm. I, I just, you know, it's again, we're learning more about the lore where Harry's increasing in power and it's as expected. We like more lore. We like the power Harry being able to do stuff he didn't think he could do. How good was that phone message that he left for the for the? Oh console? yes, yes. And then, can you read that back to me? Yeah, so great. That's one hundred percent. So everybody else could hear it. Let's be honest. Oh yeah, no, he wanted he wanted the room to stop. Mm-hmm. That's like a top five, easily top five Dresden moment for me. <laughs> like definitely Necro Sue, and that one absolutely make the top five. Like, there's very little more badass that we, badassery that we see than that call that we'll get to in a minute. It's pretty great. All right. I am creeping up towards my biggest tournament of the year so far. Hopefully it's the second biggest tournament of the year when you read the Joshi files. <laughs> so that would mean we meant we qualified for more. That's all I got up on my dome. But um, we're back to starting on an even chapter, so I have mm-hmm. more. Work, I have more work to do in the intro section than I like to do. <laughs> Want me to catch this up, and then you can take reins. Sounds like a plan. All right. Morgan is a fugitive from the law. He is accused of murdering one of the senior council members, Wizard Lafortier, and he was injured in his escape from the White Council's castle stronghold in Edinburgh. And he showed up on Harry's doorstep, which is great because he and Harry hate each other. <laughs> um, but it actually has been great for the storytelling because we get ourselves an odd couple Definitely. situation. A good conflict setup. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, the characters naturally will lead to some good places. We know that there are multiple forces working against Morgan to frame him. The White Court of Vampires has been involved. We think Madeline Wraith is the highest up that goes. We think Laura Wraith is on our side, and we have decided we're going to work together tentatively from there. We know there is a traitor somewhere 
in the White Council. We know there's a Negloshi, a Navajo skinwalker, semi-divine monster involved. Somebody powerful enough to pull their strings is around. The Black Council, the Circle, is certainly involved, at least tangentially, at some, uh, some level. And Harry is trying to find a safe place where he won't hurt bystanders. And he kind of get this conflict away from prying eyes. And he can call, get the mole to show himself. And he thinks he may have found that place in his brain. But the very most important piece of information, I mentioned this in the written recap or of the written blurb of the pod that I don't think anyone actually reads, but I don't care. I, I agonize over. <laughs> but uh, despite the things look bad, there is good news. Harry is finally starting to see Molly as a friend and trusted ally instead of just his troubled apprentice. She's proven to be someone the whole team can count on. But most importantly, Liz, she's shown enough for Harry to trust her, which is one of his character-defining unresolved issues. Huge moment for Harry and Molly and probably the brightest spot in last week's chunk. Mm -hmm. I, for one, can't wait to see where it goes from here. <laughs> All right. So Harry returns to the apartment and we have yet another ridiculous tableau. He opens the door and says, Hell's bells. What is wrong with you people? Morgan is slumped against the wall with fresh, fresh spots of blood showing through his bandage. He's got a gun in his hand. Molly is on the floor in front of the sofa. Mouth is, Mouse is literally sitting on her. And he has a paw on Lucio, who is unconscious on the couch. The air smells of cordite. Mouse has blood on his left foreleg. And Harry is not happy. He asks Morgan to explain himself, and if he does not do so, he will strangle him dead with his own hands and drag his corpse back to Edinburgh by the balls. And Murphy hops between Harry and Morgan because Harry might. And Morgan says that Molly was trying to enter Captain Lucio's mind against her will. So you shot my dog? He interposed himself. Such a good boy. Never meant to hit. I swear to God, that's it. That is it. Molly and I are going to the wall for you, and this is how you repay us. I'm pushing your paranoid ass out my door, leaving you there and starting to a pool on who comes for you first. The Black Council, the Wardens, or the goddamn buzzards. <laughs> Molly says his name and then says, he was right. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Harry. He was right. They get Morgan back into bed. And there goes my blurb. Oh, yeah. No shit. <laughs> what a coincidence. And he tells Molly to go get the medical kit from the lab. And M Murphy says, you know, it's a small caliber. He probably didn't intend it for, to be lethal. And he says he'd have killed Molly if he could have. That's attempted murder. You want to arrest him? And it is an, an issue of what I want. I'm an officer of the law, Harry. I'm a cop. It's who and, I am. And Harry also realizes, though, that if Morgan is in jail, there's no way to force a, a confrontation with Shagnasty and Madeline. And especially to get Thomas back. Murphy says, you'd do that, Morgan, for Thomas? Hi, hell's bells. It would make a mess. The council would go berserk, but but Thomas is my brother. I didn't have to say it. I didn't need to. Murphy nodded. Molly returns, and Harry explains to Mouse that he's got an ouchy bullet in him. And he tells Molly, you're going to do it. Mouse took a bullet for you, Miss Carpenter. He wasn't thinking of himself when he did it. He was putting his life at risk to protect you. If you want to remain my apprentice, you will stop saying sentences that begin with I and repay his courage by easing his pain. So, she does it. Mouse flinches and whines a little bit. But she finally gets out the, the bullet and closes up his wound. And Molly apologizes to him. And she says, there, you'll be all right. Harry asks Murphy to leave. And Harry asks Molly what happened. I, it occurred to me, Harry, that, well, if the traitor really wanted to set the council at one another's throats, 
the best way to do it would to be force one of them to do something unforgivable. Unforgivable. Like maybe force Morgan to kill Wizard Lafortier. Gee, that never once occurred to me, though I am older and wiser than you. You're doing this for most of your life. Where have you been in the business for just under four years? Yes, well, then I thought that the best way to use that sort of influence wouldn't be to use it on Morgan, but on the people who would be after him. At this point, I have to ask you if you know how difficult it is to manipulate the mind and will of anyone of significant age. Most wizards who are 80 or 100 years old are generally considered more or less immune to that kind of gross manipulation. I, I didn't know that. But she says that it wouldn't be a severe alteration. It would just be a, sm a slight nudge. Like if someone is quick to anger, you highlight that part of their personality. If they are kind of a politically motivated person, you'd nudge that to the forefront. It's how I do it, Molly said quietly, blowing her eyes. And Harry realizes that while M Molly is someone, a friend, near family, he never until that very moment thought of her as someone who might one day be very, very scary. And he says, who was I to throw stones? And he's, you know, it'd be, that'd be really difficult to prove. And Molly says, if there's one person I'd go after, I have one target. But she'd never ha let me have a look. You know she wouldn't. For good reason. I know. So you thought you'd look while everyone was unconscious when, when you wouldn't get caught. You told yourself that you were doing the right thing, just to peek in and out. And she asks Harry, what if she's not being honest with you? What if she's doing this, getting close to you because she doesn't trust you? What if she's just like Morgan, only better at hiding it? Harry tells her she doesn't know what she's talking about, but she says, who do you think taught Morgan to be this way? And, he, she, and Molly says, do you honestly think that she never knew how Morgan treated you? Yeah, I think that. You know better. No, I don't. You should. I couldn't take the chance that she would let you go down with Morgan. I had to know. I always know when I'm being tempted to do something very, very wrong. The sentences start with phrases like, I would never ever do this, but I know this is wrong, but it's the but that tips you off. And he says, you know, you broke the laws of, you willfully broke the laws of magic, even though you know, knew it would cost you your life and mine. And Harry says, I chose to trust Anastasia because it's what people do. You don't ever really know what someone thinks of you, what they really feel inside. Even psychomancy doesn't give you everything. You aren't meant to know everything that's going on in someone's head, which is very reasonable. It makes sense. And so she begins to apologize. He says, don't apologize. Maybe I'm the one who let you down. Maybe I should have t taught you better. And it doesn't matter, though. Even if they do manage to save Morgan, he's going to rat Molly out and the council will kill them both. I didn't mean to get caught. Jesus, kid. I trusted you. And they're at a catch-22. If Morgan goes down for this, there's going to be trouble. And if Morgan doesn't go down for this, there's going to be trouble. And so he says, you've got a choice. You can come with me knowing the cost if we succeed, or we can go. Go on, or you can go. Go on the run. Get the fuck out. Or you can come with me. You can do something right. Something that has meaning. Everyone dies, honey. Everyone. There's no if. There's only when. When you die, do you want to feel ashamed of what you've done with your life? Feel ashamed of what your life meant? I promise I'll be beside you. I can't promise anything else. Only then I'll stand beside you for as long as I can. And he, he says, you know, we're out of time. We're running out of time. And he, she asks what he's going to do. And he says, I'm going to attempt a sanctum invocation. Which isn't that kind of dangerous? Only a fool would take such a chance. And he said, I agreed to help Donald freaking Morgan when he showed up at my door. I qualify. So he says, get my ritual box and they're going to get the fuck out. She says, I know it was wrong, but hear me out. I know it was wrong, and I didn't get much of a look, but I swear to you, I think someone has tampered with Captain Lucio. I'd bet my life on it. Could be that you have, and mine too. And then, my favorite character in all of literature reveals to Harry that he was fucking acting. <laughs> <laughs> He's such an ass. Fuck you, He's Molly. so great. Maybe I should have named you Denzel. And he just smiles. But then Harry has a realization that when he was trying to find Thomas, Mouse interrupted him. Mouse helped Thomas track Harry 
when Madrigal was trying to sell him on eBay and he asks him, could you find Thomas? He basically says, fuck yeah, bro. And heads to the door. But he says he has another mission for him. Okay, I told him walking to the door myself. Listen up. Things are about to get sort of risky. <laughs> Rutro. Lucio is somehow still asleep. She's so, doped up as fuck. There's a gunshot, the argument, poor mouse, and nothing. But yeah, she's doped up. And it's just, it's been a long little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> For her. Harry comes up with a blanket, gives Mr. a command that to keep her company. That's not how we do things around here. You don't you don't command Mr. <laughs> but uh Or any cat for that matter. Well sure, but Mr. Mr. the most. He leaves Anastasia a note that says, basically, you can't do anything here. You can't do any more good back there. A la Luke Skywalker to wedge. And um She's going to fucking hate this when she wakes up. 100%. But if we know there's anything Harry does well, it's sideline women. I joke because the next person involved here is Murphy. Um, <laughs> it used to be a problem, but now it is less so. He gives Murphy a task. and She says, we don't know what that task is, but she says, allow me to reiterate, I feel this is a bad idea. <laughs> oh, noted. <laughs> but will you do it? She Actually, it's funny that she's also getting sidelined here. So maybe it wasn't as much of a joke as I meant a second ago. But this kind of, like, compromise, at least value-wise, the compromise of, like, he's limiting what Murphy knows, and she's worried it's because she's trying to keep her safe. And, you know, she fucking hates that. He's yeah. like, no, no, no. It's to keep me safe. There's, there's my magic bozos around. Which I actually love that that's... I mean, it right? makes sense. Yeah, but it's also just, like, a great, like... I don't know, their relationship has been, like, Building the point where there's like unequivocal trust, and now we're going the other way. That like Harry needs to, needs her to protect him by not knowing, you know? Yeah, and it's uh, not and it, you know he he does say, you know with good reason he gives her the reasons, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and it does make sense. Exactly. But that's a, a big thing too with Murphy is that if things make sense, she might not like it, but she will play the fuck along. <laughs> they talk about where they're going, and Harry uses the uh, metaphor. He's getting some party favors, but you're having a party out there. Yeah, <laughs> practically, practically everyone who'd wanted to kill me lately, lately would be there. It's a real party. This is a pub. And again, we talk about the kind of the import of this. It's like this matters more than just about Morgan. Like fuck Morgan, we don't care about Morgan. But where his that motherfucker shot my dog. He shot my dog. That did warrant a text to you when I was. Oh yeah, I was just. I do this, I throw in little Easter eggs to listeners without trying to, like... Give it away to me? Without giving it away to you or any other, you know, if there's anyone else coming along for the ride. But, and most of them are, like, super subtle. You know, like, I... Like, like really, like, there's nothing... I don't want to say anyone because I don't want you to pick them out. You start picking them out and then wonder why I bring them up. But, like, it, it really is, like, not... They're, they're, they're not spoilers, but they're just, like, references to spoilers, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no, like, I get it. It's second-level spoilers. And that's kind of why I did the, uh, like that Molly thing at the end of the blurb. Yeah. <laughs> Shit like that. Well, just, like, I just want to give people a chuckle here or there. But also, that one I don't feel like, is, even though it was a little over the top, wasn't a spoiler because it was literally, like, the next page. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't have done that even if it was two chapters in. I just thought it was really funny. They're like, oh, I wonder what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know why they brought that up, but maybe it's not here reminding me of it. This is the conversation I kind of referenced from earlier. Mm -hmm. Where, like, I don't know. And it's, I don't, the, the weird emotional moments in this book are weird to me. And maybe that's just because I'm not good with, like, talking to other human beings or emotions or, like, sharing that. Mm -hmm. But, like, Randomly kissing on the mouth, uh, the conversation earlier, the conversation with Molly. Weird. It's just like, I don't really, could be an American thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. That, that, was the, that was the scene. I told you there's a later scene that had kind of like colored my conversation about some of the other emotional scenes mm -hmm. earlier. This is the one. That, I don't think it's atrocious. I don't either. It's Especially just, because when Murphy says, what did she say? Or she, you know, where, you know, he, 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 she says, Okay, this is going somewhere awkward. Because <laughs> that's 100%, like, I get that. That's I would deal with it in a similar manner. Okay, this is getting awkward. Mm -hmm. 
But you know, you know me. I don't. I don't mind those moments. Fair enough. Because he thinks he's gonna die. He thinks this is it. So I get it. They get on the water beetle. Uh, just Molly, Harry, and Morgan, and they head out to the island where Michael uh, got crippled. It's the phrasing they use here. And Harry wants to do a sanctum invocation, which is basically trying to connect himself to the awareness. There's like a the island has power. And when anything has power, it has kind of it's an awareness. And he wants to connect himself to the island with the idea being it'll be his home turf. And he'll have, and we know that wizards are more powerful in their own domain. And really any creature is, right? So he, he basically wants to connect himself to the island. It's very dangerous. And if the island says nah, then Molly needs to go tell her dad if she needs to disappear. Because if the island says nah, what, what will you be doing, Harry? <laughs> Not much. I'll be dead. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So Harry gets on the island and he describes it as monstrous and terrifying. Invisible things touch you without warning. Ground shifts and changes. And you're basically out of sorts because it's dark. It's so dark. You know, and he's cautiously making his way up to the top of the hill. And he begins to settle into the energy of the island. As soon as he gets on the island, the power of the ley line, he he notices. He mentioned that when he was in Edinburgh, that he noticed the power of the ley lines. And he, here, the same thing happens. And so he says, what I was about to attempt had been, had its beginnings in ancient shamanic practices. A tribe's give it, A given tribe's shaman or wise one or spirit caller or whatever would set out into the wild near home and seek out a place of presence and power such as this one. Depending on the culture involved, the practitioner would then invoke the spirit of the place and draw its full attention. The ritual that what that happened next wasn't quite an introduction or a challenge or a staking of a claim on the land or a battle of will, but it incorporated elements of all those things. If the ritual was successful, it would form a partnership. If it wasn't successful, lots of bad things can happen. And so he begins the ritual. He lights the candles, and Al scares the shit out of him. And he begins to gather his will. He ignored everything around him, and then rings a bell, and says, I am not some clueless mortal you can frighten away. I am Magi. One of the wise, and I am worthy of your respect. He rings the bell again and says the same. The wind rises up around him, and he steadies the the candles with an effort of will. He set the bell down and then took up his knife and bled into a chalice and summons soul fire. As the blood drips down his hand, he reaches into the place where the, the gift of soul fire resides and sends it into his blood. Silver white sparks begin to stream from the cuts and accompany the blood down into the chalice, filling it with supernatural power far in excess of what my blood, a common source of magical energy, contained on its own. He calls out to the genus loci again and says, come forth. And he simultaneously breaks the circle and pours the enhanced blood onto the, onto the stone of the hilltop. The animals go fucking crazy. Birds fly out. Tree branches snap. And lightning strikes. The sky is clear, yet there is lightning. And a figure appears at the lighthouse. And all of the animals have appeared in the clearing. And the dark shape begins to move closer. But it has a limping gait. A drag thump. Drag thump covered in a voluminous dark cloak and is 11 or 12 feet tall. Eyes the same green color as the lightning bolts shine in the hood and they flash bright and then a gust of wind almost takes Harry out. And Harry ventus servitus and wind sends its way but barely moves the gray cloaked figure. Its eyes flash again and sharp shards of dirt and rock fly up from the ground. And then Harriet does a spell called Giodas, and a sinkhole opens up below the figure, and the figure just stands there on empty air. Harry draws water, 
and then fire. And he thinks it might have moved like half an inch. <laughs> Harry begins to get tired, but he tells it he could do it all night. And then it started walking closer to him. It stopped about five feet away, and he realizes that it was waiting for him to act. So he bows to it, infuses his voice with will, and says, I am Harry Dresden, and I give thee a name, honored spirit. From this day on, be thou called Demon Reach. The eyes flash, and sending streams of fire around its head and then demon reach mirrored his gesture and bowed and then looked toward the cottage harry goes to the well through all of this harry is nude of course puts his clothes back on and goes back to the cot goes up to the cottage and there's a fire burning in the fireplace i slid will into my voice as i said simply thank you the gentle wind that sighed through the trees of demon reach may have been a reply or maybe not. He takes a different path back to the dock. So it, take, it took him half the time it would take him to go up. And it was a... His description of it is it's like skinny, narrow, worn path, completely hidden by brush. And there are plants on it and silt. And it's just as easy to walk down as a sidewalk, even in the dark. He knew about the path, because why, why wouldn't he know about the path? He knows about the path. He didn't before. But now he does. He had information about the, the, the island. It was a success. And it was cool that we kind of saw right away, like, a small taste of the power of the Sanctum Invocation actually paying off here. Mm -hmm. It was like an instant connection, which is cool. Yeah. There was a snake called the 26th Step. <laughs> Some good stuff here. And he came back, and Molly was so, so, like, nervous that he wouldn't come back. And that's a very, like, you know, she vacillates sometimes between being this, like, this powerful woman and this little girl. And here she's the little girl. And goes down and drinks a Coke and asks about Morgan. Morgan's awake. Where are we? Demon Reach, he calls it. The island of Lake Michigan. And he says that Miss Carpenter says you were attempting a sanctum invocation. Yeah. You're here. It worked. <laughs> Such faith in him. If he's here, it must have worked. I also like because he wasn't sure. Yeah. There he's like, I thought when you had a bond was formed, it gives you access to latent energy, more power. But he also, as he explained, kind of the, the trail and hornets and the, all the different things that he just knew about the island. Morgan refers to it as a genius loci. That was the uh, the monster, the demon reach being. And what it means he got was. Intellectus. Well, he says, Into what's it? <laughs> <laughs> Intellectus. All reality exists in one piece, in one place, one moment, and you can look at the whole thing. You don't seek or acquire knowledge. You just know things. You, you get the entire picture. Uh, Morgan breaks it down. It's like, a being with Intellectus does not understand, for example, how to derive a complex calculus equation. It doesn't need the process. You show them the problem and an equation. You'd simply understand it and strip straight to the answer. I wish I were that good at math. <laughs> it's an interesting way of thinking about something. Like, yeah, they don't know. They can't tell you why they know or how they know. They just mm -hmm. know. They get into the pros and cons of intellectus and how it's different than omniscience and basically mm -hmm. like anything in and around the island. Harry's gonna have a good idea what's going on off the island. He's just a dude, so he's exactly kind of like what his goal was: was making himself more powerful at the point of the confrontation. Mm -hmm. Harry said it could be handy. Certainly, if your foes were considerate enough to come all the way out here to meet you. <laughs> like Morgan tried to be a dick. Mm -hmm. He was like, could be handy. <laughs> <laughs> he teaches Grasshopper how to learn the boats, or how to learn the boats, how to drive the boat. And he teaches her how to drive the boat so that basically, once things get going, she's just going to head out to the sunset and leave Morgan and get gone. You know, the smart thing for you to do if all goes sour is to run. Smart, but not right. You sure? Because there's a world of hurt waiting to fall. That little bit of mind magic, I don't really think ups the scales a whole lot, because Morgan's not in a good way. Mm -hmm. On so many levels. And if Harry dies, the two of Damocles will fall on her anyway, right? I think so. so. 
it doesn't really raise the stakes all that much. It more like gives her perspective, I think mm-hmm. is what why that moment was more important than even really to change the stakes of the whole thing. And he gets back to the marina, gets on a payphone, and he calls Lara. And there's a funny back and forth about penises and other things. And we learned that the money deposited in Morgan's account came from a dummy corporation called Windfall. Harry says, who owns it? I do. <laughs> uh, since you're sharing this information, I take it that happened without your knowledge. You are quite correct. <laughs> so whoever had killed Fort Fortier hadn't just intended the council to implode. He or they had also gone to a lot of trouble to incite hostility within the White Court. The plot definitely thickens. And this would definitely expand the war again with the Red Court, because the White Court are allies. It would just be, as Harry phrases, after that, it would all be over but heroic last stand. Hell's belt. So the White Court and White Council are being played against each other by Madeline. Bitch. And Lara promises to, when she catches up with her, tear out her entrails with my bare hand. Which sounds like something awful. Mm-hmm. And painful. Well, I mean, like, it'll hurt your wrists if you're not careful, but, like, if you just pull straight, <laughs> just make sure they don't get tangled or anything. You just pull and they come out the hole, right? I don't understand. Kind of. I don't, do not, do not help me understand. I won't. That's why I stopped. <laughs> oh. It was an intentional maneuver. That's why I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> she give, He gives Lara some info about where Madeline was holed up and where the in-between for the business died or was killed by Madeline. He lets her know the binders involved. And, you know, Lara says, if, if, if this guy is dead, she's tied up the loose ends in their plan. It will be impossible to prove credible evidence that I did not pay for Lafortier's murder. He's like, yeah. That's why she did it. <laughs> Duh. What do we intend to do about this, Harry? Do you have a nice dress? Pardon? I'm throwing a party. <laughs> He calls Thomas's phone. Harry! Thomas answers. <laughs> Thomas, how's it going? Oh, I'm just hanging around. <laughs> I love that they can still be chummy, jokey when, uh, in this situation. But that's how they do horrible, horrible situations. Mm-hmm. He is here. He's alive. For now. Give me the doomed warrior. Okay. Bring him to me! Nah, that's not gonna happen. What? You're coming to me. Do you wish me to end his life this instant? Frankly, Shaggy, I don't give a damn. It'd be nice to be able to return one of the vampires to his own, get myself a marker I can call in one day, but I don't need it. You, on the other hand, need Thomas to be alive, if you expect me to trade Morgan for him. So this is how it's gonna go down. (laughs) Takes some balls. Oh, I love it. This is like my third favorite phone call of the day <laughs> and it's great yeah harry tells him his deal you're gonna come when i tell you you'll pick him up he's like i am not some mortal scum you can command mageling no you're immortal scum <laughs> 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 oh and he hangs up on him which is great and this last call i mentioned to lissy is one of my favorite dresden moments like it might and it's a moment with a capital M. Oh, yeah. But it is such a great... Like, so who is Harry Dresden in this world? Oh, here, just read this. <laughs> you know I mean? Right. Like, here, let me give you the, the recording of this phone conversation. Exactly. <laughs> he says he needs to give this message to every member of the senior council. That's you know, just a young woman, you know, in a brown robe, answering phone calls, right? Like, because they can't put anyone powerful next to the phones for any amount of time. And he said, I'm going to read this because it's so fucking good. Be advised that I have been sheltering Warden Donald Morgan from discovery and capture for the past two days. An informant has come to me with details of how Warden Morgan was framed for the murder of senior council member Lafortier. Warden Morgan is innocent. And what's more, I can prove it. I'm willing to meet with you tonight on the uncharted island in Lake Michigan, east of Chicago at sundown. The informant will be present and I will produce testimony That will vindicate Warden Morgan and identify the true culprit of the crime. Let me be perfectly clear. 
I will not surrender Warden Morgan to the alleged justice of the council. Come in peace, and we will work things out. But should you come to me looking for a fight, be assured that I will oblige you. The assistant had started making choking sounds. Then sign it, Harry Dresden. <laughs> Shall I read it back to you? <laughs> Please. And as she's reading it, you hear all the people in the background, like, stop working and come over and listen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I told her. Perfect. Such a fucking badass moment. It is. It really is. So Harry heads back to the ICU and we learn that we don't know how Andy is doing. We don't know if she's going to recover or not. And Harry says, I need you both. Questions asked. They head back to the, uh, the marina and Harry says, wait, wait here for a minute. He goes into the parking lot and Toot Toot arrives and he says, Toot, I have two missions for you at once, my lord. No, I want you to do them one at a time. Oh. And first he gives Tutu the silver amulet and tells him to go out and take that to his apprentice on the lake. And second, he asks, how many of the little folk can you convince to join the guard for one run night? And Tutu says, I don't know, Lord Harry. The pizza rations already stretch as far as it can go. The guard's pay won't change. I'll order extra to pay for the new guy's service. Call them the Za Lord's Militia. We only need them sometimes. How many do you think would agree to do that? For you? Every sprite and pixie and dewdrop fairy within a hundred miles knows that you saved our kind from being imprisoned by the Lady of the Cold Eyes. There's not a one who didn't have a comrade or kin languishing endurance vile. Well, tell them that there may be great danger. Tell them that if they wish to join the militia, they must obey orders. And I will pay them one large pizza for every four score volunteers. <laughs> That's less than you pay the guard, Harry. Well, they're amateurs, not full-time veterans like you and your men, are they? <laughs> and he says that he will henceforth be known as Major General Toot Toot Minimus, commanding the Za Lord's elite. What do you wish us to do when I have them, my lord? I want you to play. Here's what we're going to do. They all get on the boat, and Molly drives them. One to two degrees south of due east, towards the island. It begins to rain, which causes a bit of an issue. And he, you know, he says, had planned on laying off the island until closer to dark. Why? Mostly because I just challenged the senior counsel to a brawl there at sundown. Molly choked on her gum. He's, he didn't want to make it easy on them. And he agreed to trade Thomas for Morgan with Check Nasty. But he won't get to know where they're going until later. You're trading Morgan for Thomas? Nah, I just want to get Shag Nasty out there with Thomas in one piece so the White Court can take him down. The White Court, too? Yep. They've got a stake in this as well. Why do you think the senior cha counsel will take you up on your challenge? Because I told him I was going to be producing an informant who would give testing about who really killed Lafortier. Do you have something like that? No. <laughs> but the killer doesn't know that. Why, no, Miss Carpenter. He doesn't. I made sure my word got around headquarters of my challenge to the senior counsel. He's got no choice but to show up here if there's any chance at all that I might have actually found an informant ready to blow his identity. Which, by the way, would also provide the existence of the council. What if there's no chance of such an informant existing? Kid, groups like these guys, the ones who maim and kill and scheme and betray, they do what they do because they love power. And when you get people who love power together... They're all holding out a gift in one hand while hiding a dagger behind the, their back in the other. They regard an exposed back as a justifiable provocation to stick the knife in. The chances that this group has no one in it who might believe second thoughts and try to back out by bargaining with the council for a personal problem are less than zero. So, and he says, I think this happened because the killer slipped up and exposed himself to Lafortier, but he had to take Lafortier out. Everything he's done has smacked of desperation. His only chance is to tie off any loose ends that might lead back to him. He'll be here tonight, and he's got to win. He has nothing to lose. And she's you know, putting everybody in this pressure cooker. And this person is already desperate enough to be making mistakes. 
especially dragging in the white court, put everybody together in one place with lots of power, and it's his worst nightmare. As With as much power as they have, there's no way he's going to be able to fight them all. Yeah, it sucks to feel helpless, especially for a wizard, because we usually aren't. Or at least we usually are able to convince ourselves, which is interesting. And, you know, we think they'll be, he'll be there and they'll do something stupid. Something to take everyone down before they know a fight is on. A sneak attack, which won't be a sneak attack if you know where he is. Intellectus, capital thinking, grasshopper. <laughs> you know, Thomas can sail in ship weather, but Harry can't. So they're going to have to go back to the island and uh, take their chances. So they head over and he tells everyone, don't step on the land until I get a chance there to get there first. I uh, sort of, I, I want to uh, sort of introduce you. <laughs> Billy gives him a look. Uh, okay, Harry. And he, Harry climbs down from the bridge when a tall, slender figure in a black robe, black cape, and black hood appear from behind the veil. Standing at the very end of the dock, he lifted his old rune-carved staff, muttered a word, and then brought it smashing down onto the wooden planks. Harry had time to draw on his will, cross his arms at the wrist, and create a shield, but everybody else went down. The robed figure stood there staring at me for a few seconds. Then it spoke in a deep voice. Put the staff down, Dresden. Swirling narcotic colors gathered around his staff as he pointed at me like a gun. It is over. It's Wizard Rashid, also known as the gatekeeper here. And interesting conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Tells Harry to lay aside his staff, and he says he can't do that. And I cannot permit you to openly challenge the White Council to battle. No? Why not? It is not yet your hour. Not yet. Places in time. This is not the time or the place. What you are about to do will cost lives. Among them your own. I wish you no harm, young wizard. But if you will not surrender... So be it. There's a lot in that conversation. It's just that short conversation mm -hmm. to unpack. Harry lets Rashid know that the Black Council has been doing a lot of shenanigans of late. And based on that last conversation, you'd think Rashid would be aware of more of them than he was. So it's interesting that he does have some time shenanigans, but he doesn't know everything. Mm -hmm. And then it asks further questions about what's important about the things he does know, right? Because if you only know some sort of time shenanigans, mm -hmm. presumably there's some import to that gift, right? Yeah. We can talk more about that in a minute, but I definitely want to go over that. Like, not only that, the gatekeeper has some time visions stuff, but in back-to-back -back conversations, he says he knows about when one thing's supposed to happen, and he doesn't know about what's going on with the other thing. Mm -hmm. So it juxtaposes. And basically, Harry kind of brings up that, like, all of the stuff that we've seen in these files are connected. There's a greater through line running, running beneath everything that we, we don't see yet. And it's the Black Council doing something. We're not sure why or what, but they're doing something. And, you know, and Harry, after this whole explanation, says, the world is getting weirder and scarier. And we're so busy beating on one another, we can't even see it. Someone's behind it. And he watched me silently for a long moment and said, yes. Anything I'm with? <laughs> no, 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 no. Absolutely not. And it's just this paragraph here I'm not going to read because my deep Rashid voice <laughs> doesn't let me read full paragraphs. But he adds some more weirdness to the things that Harry describes. Among them, the most powerful artifacts of the church vanishing from the world and, as some signs indicate, being kept by a wizard who does not so much as pay lip service to faith. But all the revolts, what's her name? Aurora's death and all these things. <laughs> it's like, well, when do you put it like that? <laughs> but I swear, I swear by my magic, I'm not with them. I'm trying to figure this out. You have to find solutions where you can, not where convenient. That's, that's, that sentence is wrong. You have to find solutions that are convenient, not what you want, right? Yeah. I get what he's saying. Some more energy. He lets, him, he lets Harry grab Molly out of the water so she doesn't drown. They take like a five-minute break from their hostilities here. And we learned that Rashid came through the never-never to the island. He knows a way. He's been here before, which is interesting. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, he says, I, I thought about trying to find a way out here. You want to chance it. This isn't exactly Mayberry. I doubt it hooks up to anything pleasant in the Never Never. And the gatekeeper muttered something to himself and said, I cannot decide whether you are the most magnificent liar I have ever encountered in my life, or if you truly are as ignorant as you appear. <laughs> Points at his concussion bandage and says, Dude! And Rashid thinks back to where they cross paths in the Never Never in Summer Night when Harry had exploded out of the binding spell mm -hmm. covered in mud up to a tree. <laughs> you don't know what this place is. It's out of the way of innocent bystanders. And we get more insight on this place than we've had in a while. I think so far, really. And it's not much. We get a little bit, right? Very little. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. Gatekeeper asks him what he thinks this place is. And there's a ley line that comes through it. Very dark and dangerous. And there he calls it the Demon Reach. And so the gatekeeper thinks about that, muses on that name, and says it's very fitting. But the big thing he tells us isn't, is that the ley line does not go through the island. This is where it wells up. The island is its source. Wells up from what? In my opinion, that is a very <laughs> useful question. He still wants Harry to back down even after this. And he kind of figures out the plan, right? He's laying a trap for the traitor mm -hmm. to try to reveal himself. And, but like if the gatekeeper can figure that out, like so can the other guy. I was like, well, yeah, of course. But... You still have to come. The risk is too great, even if you're like 95% sure, right? Like, you still got to make sure. And so he's going to show up and be sneaky and choose his moment. We seem to see what well, looks, this looks to me like this is the gatekeeper's future power. Like, if he can act, thinks of something specific, he can do this weird twitchy thing where he kind of looks ahead. That's how I took this. And he says that, you know, Harry's chances of survival are minimal. And what I, I just love this kind of like show of power, I guess, where Harry walks past him and stands on the island. How about now? <laughs> Blood of the prophet. Is that an Islam thing? Must I, be, right? I, Might be. I think so. Harry tells him that he's claimed the place as a sanctum. And he said, it'll give Harry a fighting chance. Yes, today. But there's always a price for knowledge. But it'll be me paying the price. Not everyone else. Which is Harry. In a nutshell. Yeah. No, I love. And he tells Harry not to touch the power of this place. And then also that he can't set foot on the island. <laughs> Why not? Because this place holds a grudge. I suddenly thought of the drag thump limp of the island's manifest spirit. Your friends awaken in a moment. I will do what I can to help you. Thank you. Do not. It may be a, that true kindness would have been to kill you today. He stepped through the way and he was out. We had to get moving. Day wasn't getting any younger. And there were a lot of things to do before nightfall. Whoo wait. They're setting things up and Harry is fall down sleeping. He's exhausted. And Will says, we can finish the rest of it on our own. We'll wake you up when, it's, when something happens. So he goes and lays down and Will wakes him four hours later. And Georgia had been patrolling the shoreline and says that there's a boat approaching it, approaching the island. And it's coming from the west, which means they'll have to sail around the island to get to the reef. And uh, Molly has, holds a crystal of white quartz in her hands. And he says, don't, for, don't hesitate to use a crystal if things get dicey. And she veils her and Morgan. And he says, let's go, people. Party time. As Harry's walking around the hillsides of the, of the island, he's feeling aware. He says, the night wasn't falling so much as it was sharpening its claws. That's a great turn of phrase, by the way. Yeah. It really is. And a boat is coming in. It's a rented boat. Ebenezer McCoy is at the wheel of the boat. Listens to wind is with him, as is ancient Mai. And there is a handful of wardens on either side of Ancient Mai. And they pull into the dock. Harry greets Ebenezer. And Ebenezer asks, Rashid, with us. I replied quietly, trying not to move my lips. Again, lots of super secret squirrel stuff going on. And everybody gets off the boat. But Harry steps back from them onto the actual land. 
and feels it instantly. It wasn't as if someone had whispered in my ear. I simply knew, felt it, the way you know it when an ant is crawling across your arm. He stopped a step later, and I kept going until I was about ten feet away. So he turns to face them, with the three members of the senior council and the handful of wardens, and Ebenezer says, Well, Wizard Dresden, we got your note. I figured. Did you get as far as the part where I said if you wanted to fight, I would oblige you? <laughs> I, I thought it would be more profitable if we could talk about things first. Indeed, said Ancient Mai, but we can always kill you after. Obviously, the disrespect you offered the White Council merits some form of response. Do not flatter yourself by thinking that we have come to you because we lack other options. At the same time, your reputation as an investigator is unrivaled. You said you have a witness and proof of his innocence. And he says, I have more than that. But we need to wait till everyone arrives. And Ebenezer's like, what others? Who else? And Harry explains that Morgan, Morgan was being set up as a patsy. When you tra manage to track down the source of the money found in Morgan's account, you'll find it comes from a corporation owned by the White Court. How do you know this? I investigated. After further investigation, I concluded that the money had probably been out the knowledge of the White Court's leadership. The guilty party not only wished Lafortier dead, he also wanted to manipulate the council into renewing hostilities with the vampire courts. And there is proof of this? I believe there will be. They're saying, you know, it might take some time, longer than the duration of unjust trial. In other words, whatever measures being taken to veil Morgan from our track, forcing you to seek this meeting. I had to work hard to keep from twitching. The only thing worse than scary is smart and scary, which is true. And Angel Mice says that it obviously Dresden's involved. And if Dresden's here, Morgan is probably here. Arrest Dresden and keep tracking Morgan. We can attend to the business in a proper and orderly fashion back at Edinburgh. And Willis's Wynn says no mention was made of other parties present. This is council business and no one else's. Adding representatives of the White Court to this meeting could prove as disastrous as the war you claim to be trying to avoid. And Ebenezer says it doesn't mean we should arrest him. And listen to him says we can postpone a trial. But the truth, if he, what he says is true, the truth will come out. You know as well as I do that the outcome of the trial is not going to be changed by the truth. There is a world that should be and the world that is. We live in one and must create the other if it is ever to be. And Listen to Wind says to Ebenezer, There are no good paths to choose, old friend. All we can do is choose if many die or are free. I am sorry, House Dresden, but I must agree. Arrest him. I don't like Ancient Mai. Me neither. She's mean. Yeah, she's no not nice. No not nice at all. Harry, this is, is a, we really get to see, again, he mentioned it, without a trigger warning about an ant crawling on your arm. Are you okay, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I felt it. I can feel them crawling on me. That's the problem when you talk about that. Uh, Lizzie has antelectus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so dumb. I think that's going to be the, the title this week. <laughs> but we see more power flexing of the electus here where he feels Georgia and Billy slinking closer. He can feel, like, the tension among the warden. And he can't, like, read their mind, but he gets the sense that they aren't eager to start this fight. Mm -hmm. and he's like, he said he wants to laugh. Because, yeah, I mean, one-on-one, -on -one, sure. I, I, I probably, probably would have been able to get him. Any of the three senior council members, Harry has no chance against. Yeah. The five of them together, and they're nervous to start a fight. And we've talked about this before. They're not dealing with Harry Dresden. Harry's lack of understanding of who he is gets him into trouble sometimes. Here, it solves a problem. Because this isn't Harry Dresden. This isn't our lovable, unlucky in love and friendship wizard P.I. with a whole lot of socialization. They're dealing with the potential demonic dark lord nightmare warlock they've been fearing since I turned 16. They were dealing with the wizard who faced the heirs of Kemmler riding a zombie dinosaur. <laughs> Emerged victorious from a fight that had flattened Morgan and Lucio before they'd even reached it. They were dealing with the man who dropped a challenge to the entire senior council. And what actually showed! <laughs> Apparently willing to fight on the shores of an entirely too creepy island in the middle of a freshwater sea. Technically, I was all those people. That was that person. But come on. 
They just know that after all he's been through, the fact that he's still standing is insane. They're afraid of what of what they know he can do, but also of what they terrified do. of what they they don't know he can do. Exactly. And none of them knew that I would so much rather be back in my apartment reading a good book and drinking a cold <laughs> beer. Harry didn't move when Listen to Winds told him to arrest him. I stood there as if I wasn't much impressed. He goes into a memory of when he had first moved to the Ozarks because he saw a small, subtle smile on Ebenezer's face. And he said it was the same smile he saw this day. He had just wiped out a major demon, he who walks behind, as they call him, as well as a warden of the White Council in a pair of fair fights. Local teenage bullies were beneath my notice. He could have killed them without all too much trouble. But the idea was laughable. Like using a flamethrower to clean cobwebs out of the house. Which I love. <laughs> I love that idea. And here, what Harry had done in that moment was he just like looked at him like, what the fuck are you going to do to me? And kind of the silence lulled them. But, but it's more the idea here is that Harry's silence in the face of this danger is just fueling their uncertainty. Like, this guy is terrifying. He challenged the entire senior council to a fucking throwdown. And not, you know, like a, in a kind of quiet way. Yeah. It was like, yeah, yeah. Called out the fucking world. Can you read that back to me? Can you read that back to me? Exactly. And, you know, we talked about this. Harry and Harry Potter both have the same, same self-doubt. Where it's like, you guys don't understand. Like, I was lucky and all of a sudden, I'm like, sure. Well, like, you make it out of seven of those goddamn books. Like, you're not lucky anymore. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a pattern. They don't know. They just don't know. And so these wardens are fucking terrified at this five-on-one fight prospect. But you remember when they took down Kemmler? Mm-hmm. The discussion was, who took him down? The White Council. Oh, they sent a couple wardens? No, no. The White Council. <laughs> like, the entire senior council. <laughs> the entirety of the White Council. Yeah, basically, every, everyone they could get, they mustered. And Ebenezer says, well, gentlemen... You've heard the will of the council, such as it is, but you should be advised that you're doing something foolish at the behest of someone acting foolish. I won't be assisting you. McCoy! Wizard Ma, I would advise you not to seek a quarrel with this young man. <laughs> He's a fair hand in a fight. He was not truly your apprentice. You watched over him for a mere two years and came to know him. What that raccoon pup you had think of him? Little brother, was his name. You all know what a good judge of character young animals can be. Is he the sort of man who would involve himself in that, this kind of plot? You know the answer. It isn't about that, and you know it. If you do not assist us in, in subduing him, it could be considered treason, Wizard McCoy. I am assisting you by advising you to avoid conflict. You might try asking him. Ask him politely to come back with you to end. Maybe he'd cooperate. I like doing my... I love doing voices. <laughs> Fun. I realized I was going to just read this entire chapter if I didn't catch myself. It is a great exchange. And he tells him, no, no, don't worry. I, I, I'm not, I can't, sir. I can't go back. He remains still because he, everyone wasn't in place yet. And so he didn't want to quite have the fight start. And they heard a helicopter <laughs> leaping by about an inch and a half above the treetops, which I love. Came back and it hovered about 30 feet above the shoreline. And a couple of vampires jumped out. Laura and two sisters. They walked toward us and they were good at it. <laughs> <laughs> she had a sword and guns and she's dressed to the nines for the party <laughs> trying to keep his tongue in his mouth and look out anywhere else Laura and Harry have a very familiar conversation which I, again like the, cover, the words don't matter but adding to the fear and distrust and self doubt that the wardens have that they can tell take Harry he just has a casual conversation with the number two the number two member of House Wraith of the White mm -hmm. Court. It is a very powerful thing to do. To just stand and chat. Standing and chatting with Laura Wraith like you're an old pal is a fucking terrifying thing for <laughs> anyone coming at you to do. A wee bit. And a little bit of a red flag. <laughs> they clasp hands but she whispers him an implied threat. And then she smacks the shit out of him. <laughs> she calls him a liar. She's mad. You know, she says that if her brother's not returned, there'll be blood. And then with the eye that the, the wizards can't see, she winks at him. Do you understand? Uh, yeah. 
Mess- mess- message received? <laughs> <laughs> Lara goes up, introduces herself to HMI and to the other members of Senior Council. <laughs> and Ebenezer says, Lady Wraith, touch that boy again, and the only things left for your kid to bury will be your $500 shoes. <laughs> and he's got uh, some six foot tall, what do you call that? Oh, needing a blanket. A six foot tall Ozark folk, uh, folk yeah. staff. Yes, exactly. Walking club, but his is black. He uh, he could <laughs> yes he could do the things he's talking about. Yes, and she probably knows of it. Ooh, interesting. She probably does in particular. I wonder if anyone else knows that she knows. <laughs> she traffics on those things. On behalf of the White Court, I propose a formal agreement of non-aggression for the duration of this meeting. Agent Mai agrees and accepts on, the, on behalf of the council. He staggers back to verticality again. Harry describing his ass beatings is like so good. And his head injuries. <laughs> yeah. They share knowledge about the situation. Ray, Thomas has been stolen by the shag, the uh, shag nasty, by the skinwalker. And there's a trade that's been offered, Morgan, for Thomas. Harry's involved with this because he has wizard morgan she mentions how often harry and her have worked together lara which is great on a lot of levels one it makes harry seem more powerful two it makes harry seem more scary three it makes her seem more powerful that she just casually works with wizards and four it's not untrue not true true but it's not untrue right but where harry abuse he, he has abused my good intentions repeatedly Wizard Mai and Lara have a back and forth, con- their back and forth continues. But basically, we're here, we're suspic- suspicious, we'd like to not fight each other, quite frankly. And Agent Mai says a line that's interesting, and I like. Those who ally themselves with the white court come to regret it. And that's something we've seen borne out. We start to get a storm coming through, lightning flashes, listens to wind, has an interesting reaction where his gaze snaps to the north and his eyes narrowed. And as soon as that happened, he sensed a new presence. More people had just touched down on the far side. Twelve of them. Seconds later, a couple human-like presences appear. Two other people hop out of a way. And among them, we see muscle coming through the, through the Never Never. That's going to be Binder and his goons. He's with Madeline on the beach. My ancient Mai and Lara are bearing their claws, basically. I was like, I'm not here to fight you, but I'm here to get back my brother. The wardens are getting... These poor, poor baby wardens. They're just getting more and more nervous and more and more outgunned at this, by the second. They're already scared of the one fucking bozo. You know, Harry's like, holy crap. I knew this would put pressure on the guy, but he's gone to war. And... He just tells Lara, like, hey, stop. We need to stop getting after each other. Or we're all we're all dead. Because better than a hundred a hundred. Hundred and ten now beings have just arrived at different points of the island and aren't here to cater the little mixer we've got going. There's nine of us and fifteen to you. Fifteen of you. We're outnumbered five to one. Six to one now. We hear some howls and some shit. There's a couple packs moving at them. He needs to ask Demon Reese the correct questions and he can help him out. And so he realized. Basically, when you're this outnumbered, you got to go punch one of them in the face, hopefully get them down, and then you can move on to the next pack. We got to get after it. Hey, I said, tell Ebenezer while raising my staff, they got us boxed in. Our only chance is to fight our way clear. The council members and the wardens, they start gathering their power, facing the oncoming rush, the onrushing attack. Harry consults Demon Reach for the best route to follow towards the enemy. And I put my head down. Charge the demons that were coming to kill us. Wardens and vampires alike at my side. I uh, love it. I love the cliffhanger. We're kind of like, you know, right, ready to fight. I love everything about it. And um, uh-huh. yeah, what were your thoughts? I know we touched it at the beginning, but kind of more coherently. I mean, it's just another another build up, you know, more conspiracy additions. Absolutely, it's, it's good a good chunk though, good chunk. 
obviously the tableau uh, was funny as well. Again, this is yeah kind of a great three beat. Like this is like maybe the first place straightforward. The second one's for a laugh, and the third one <laughs> kind of oh, called it turns something on its head. But that's what it does, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is that. You know, the first time Morgan's actually kind of right. An ass. The second time, it's like Morgan's kind of an ass, but whatever. It's funny. And then the third time, it subverts it in that Molly fucked up exactly what Morgan thought was going to happen happened. Yeah, very true. And and it, you know, it, it's it's it is a big deal. Oh, absolutely. You know, and so it's just trying to come to grips with it, and then knowing that somebody did fuck with an associate. Yeah, the, la the layers there that come out are, um, it's a very important chapter. We, yeah. learn, more, we learn more about Mouse because he was faking it like an asshole. The brat. We also, like, learn more about Molly's resolve to keep yeah. fighting, which is, you know, that's why Harry picked her, you know? <laughs> she's the type of person, she's gonna keep coming even if you fuck up. Yeah. Like, you know, I work with kids, I talk about all the time, like, I... I want them to fall on their face. You know, like you, you learn when you fuck up. Obviously I don't want them to do anything crazy. I don't want a drunk driver or anything like that. But like, you know, like I want you, I want them to make choices that don't work out and learn and grow. And that's, that's part of life. Right. And she fucked up here, but like, and that's bad. Fucking up is always bad. Like you, she knew better. She shouldn't have done. Yeah. It. She needs to do better. She does. She definitely does. But what do you do next? Exactly. Where do you, I mean, do you think that the reason that, he didn't try to wake up Lucio's because Molly said somebody fucked with her head. That is interesting. I was, I was hoping you'd kind of think in that direction. Cause I kind of like, she's a powerful wizard. She yeah. could help. And I've had that same thought. Like, I think in his mind, he was being doing what, what he wrote is what he thought. Yeah. But underlying, I, I, I thought that same thing. It's just kind of one of those, like, is it because of this or, because she's injured. Or is it a little bit of both? You know. No, it's very interesting. Toot Toot is the best. Obviously. And I, I've been calling him the major generous for a while, even though he hasn't technically been granted his promotion. <laughs> but he is the major generous. Heck yeah. And I love that. Again, Harry's legend is wide sweeping. Every mm -hmm. pixie and dewdrop fairy for fucking miles. Wherever I get the word out, they're going to come for you, right? Like, think of that that level of power. People yeah. don't think about the little folk all that much. Hey, we know that's wrong. But any magical creature, if you can get all of them on your side, like, it says something about you, right or wrong, depending on how you do it, right? It says something about your character. I think the invocation is cool. It is. And I also was thinking, do we think that there's more to this than just that particular ritual? Because he previously had a familiarity with the island. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Like, obviously, there's some sort of deeper connection, right? I don't know. What do you mean? He was previously there and, and knew things about the island. Yeah, no, I know that. You know, like, it feels like there's more to it than just this one ritual. Yes. I'm going to agree with the word yes. That's how so, I generally agree with someone. As we'll see, I, mean, I don't really want to talk too much about it until we get further, but, like, the gatekeeper in particular, having a, a, a familiarity with these, this island should give you an idea of what types of shenanigans are afoot. Yeah. And that might be too much, might not be enough, but either way, I don't think it's too, too, I think it, whatever. And um, the island is obviously not straightforward. No, not in any way, shape, or form. It's the source I, of a ley line. It's the source that wells up, yeah, a ley line. Um, Which is interesting. And it has a grudge against the gatekeeper. Yeah, I love the idea that the gatekeeper permanently injured this thing <laughs> but and also a, it's a whole island that he's not allowed on yeah but also like if he's powerful enough to fuck it up but also he's not allowed on the island anymore yeah it's powerful enough to fuck him up right like is that how he got away from it like um, that's crazy like, and how, <laughs> harry punched it in the nose and now it wants to be friends right uh, i love that and um yeah certainly his intellectus where he can feel things crawling on his skin was, is very interesting. I want, I think the fight could be cool. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that, but it's, the fight's got to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, how the intellectus, you know, interacts is 
I'm intrigued. I said it. That phone call is one of the Dresden Dresdeniest moments. Like both sides of it. They're like, fuck you, I'm coming. I'm going to die, but I'm coming. <laughs> and the just blowing up the perspective of him in the world. Like mm-hmm. this is a fucking he's that guy, pal. Like he's fucking terrifying. And you see how, how scared these wardens are. And he's just like, it's Terry thinks it's funny because he's not, but he's built up this aura where he can beat anything. Yeah. Which is cool. But I just love how straightforward. It, and then like you hear the people in the background, like slow down and stop as she's reading it back. I just thought it was such a great way to give that information. I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's just, it, it again, adds to Harry's mystique. Yeah, no, exactly. And again, like when Laura comes up and talks about how like he works with me all the time, but he keeps double crossing me, but I keep coming back. You know, like, like, what the fuck is this guy? (laughs) Um, I just, I love looking at Harry through the lens of someone not in his inner circle. It's just such a great. Well, but also we only know of Harry as the narrator in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. And that's just the, that's just what, that's our knowledge of him is based on his own kind of version of the events, you know? Well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I love, that's why looking, looking through the lens of someone else is so funny and so valuable because like, he's fucking terrifying in universe. This guy's a fucking like, again, he, 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 he fucking, do you know what uh, he walks behind is yet? The guy that he, the, the demon creature. I don't, thing? I don't, I don't know. Okay. So he defeated, he walks behind and Justin to mourn. You don't need to know more than that, but if he, he walks behind and Justin to mourn in the same day, at 16, having never been worn an apprentice robe, apprentice robe. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's just a lot. Absolutely. But like, that was the starting point. Yeah. And since then he's, you know, towed the, towed the legal line and defeated monsters all over the place. He murdered a fucking fairy queen. Yeah. And that's the thing where it's just like, he's just a lot, you know, and it just, it adds to it. I do have a very mundane question yeah. about the setup for this. What does Harry do now without payphones? Well, now... There's no payphones anymore. I don't know what he does now because he's... How old is he now? And in universe, we actually haven't gotten to now. It's, okay. not, it's not now now. It's still then. Okay. But when's it going to be now? Exactly. Soon. <laughs> just, you know. We missed... We just now. Uh... <laughs> One of the most brilliant scenes in comedy history, of which Mel Brooks has probably been responsible for 10 of 25, <laughs> <laughs> at least. But the fast forwarding the movie in Spaceballs so that they could find where the, where, the guy, where the good guys went and track them down is so fucking genius and so fucking hilarious. I love it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Just love Mel Brooks. Pretty great. It doesn't all hold up. No, but but he is just so good. Overarching. <laughs> like literally every single time someone like walk this way is like a, a very popular song. B like hey, let, let, let's let's go let's walk this way before you know just something comes up all the time mm-hmm. and every time I do a little like head toss and <laughs> like <laughs> get, like a hair toss like chin up. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. I am not like normal boys and girls. We're moving. All right. So um, when they're all on the island, do you th- it did Listens to Wind sense the Shag Nasty? That's what it felt like. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, right? I don't remember all, all the specifics. But that's when he like did that little whoop. Yeah, that's the, that's the vibe I got. Okay, yeah, no, I'm glad you say... I like when you say things that I think but don't want to say. Okay. <laughs> but that was one of them, yeah. It would make sense that he has some sort of connection with it. Is it luck that he's one of the ones that went, that is there? I think it's intentional. That's interesting. And... I mentioned this about Rashid. Like, did he do, like, a Doctor Strange thing there? With his eyeball twitching? I don't know. Where he's looking into the future. That's what it felt like to me. And it's weird that like 
he can have knowledge about certain things, but not others. And we've already seen that Harry's involved in them. Or maybe Molly. Yeah. Because remember, he, he had that little flutter. And so how he looks into the future is important, but not nearly as important as like, what can't, what is he allowed to? Because it doesn't seem to be everything. He also thought Harry might be black counsel. Yeah. So he doesn't have all the insight and he knows it's not Harry's time to die. But yeah, there's that's a lot of interesting. Very strange to me. Because we know Harry's time to die was in the alley in Dead Beat. I just wonder, like, I want to know more about Rashid. Yes, he's an interesting character. An interesting part of the mythos. And then the parlay itself was great. Yeah. Again, because there's so many characters who, like, have to be the big dog. Yes. That it creates a level of tension. Oh, definitely. That makes the conversation very interesting. And it there's so much distrust in Harry, but fear, that it just adds and adds and adds, and then throws the white court, and things are just getting more and more crazy I and you want to add you want to add to not everyone knows about the black that the black staff exists much less who it is but add to Ma ancient Mai's level of suspicion where this crazy fucking warlock monster mm -hmm. is here and now the goddamn black staff who had a couple years to potentially be influenced by him is now taking his side in one of the, in a and then up rolls the white court yeah like, that, like, like add it's just adding to the tension, adding to the issue. And it's, and it's not that the white court rolls up and is like, you know, it's Lara walks up, you know, gives him a little embrace and then smacks the shit out of him. Yeah. Like, clearly they have There's history. some sort of history. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> it is, this aura, this image, this idea of Harry is so fucking great and powerful and I love it. Mm -hmm. So, then we'll see what happens. And again, as they're standing there he starts telling them what's happening on the other side of the island mm -hmm. which is not things that eyeballs can do generally speaking because like there's stuff in between here and there so <laughs> that conversation alone is that or that scene alone is just like we we not only do we not know not how powerful this guy is but we don't even understand the types of power that exist in and around this guy right like he's just He's he's just on a different level, and he, he he may be he may actually be too, even if he doesn't believe it. But like, he's certainly not on the level that they think he is, which is funny. Yeah, uh, I think that's most of what I got. I yeah, same. Those are about only little notes I've written. So awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, this is this is the the chess chessboard center that I talk about all the time. But like, it's fucking great. This, uh, these are yeah. all. Like this, it's it's usually the third to last chunk. It's always one of my favorite, even though yeah. it's not you right. Like it's just like we get set up for the big fight. The climax is ready to like we're ready to pull the trigger, and Butcher's just so fucking good. Yeah, he really is. He really crafts a, a great, lots of great suspense. Quite good. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have any yikes myself. I don't know where you landed on the yikes front. I didn't have any. Right. Yep. Well then, uh, there wasn't yeah. even anything real sketch in this, so yeah, I didn't feel like it either. What'd you have? You have any quotes? Of course I do. You were acting, I said, to make it hit Molly harder. His tail wagged back and forth proudly. Damn, I said, I'm impressed. Maybe I should have named you Denzel. <laughs> oh, that was mine. And this is Murphy. Yes, thank you. I feel less left out now that I know someone might kill me anyway. She shifted, settling her gun's shoulder harness a little more comfortably. I am aware of my limits. That isn't the same thing as liking them. <laughs> same, girl. I was not at all scared, even a little. The only reason my mouth was so dry than all the fire had been, all that fire that had been flying around. How did you learn this? Shockingly, with magic. You've, you've claimed this place as a sanctum? Uh-huh. How? I punched it in the nose. Now we're friends. <laughs> But it will damn be it! Me. Sorry. But it will be me paying the price, I said. Not everyone else. And I said this while we're doing it, but I don't care. Night wasn't falling, so much as sharpening its claws. And the last one, the only thing worse than scary is smart and scary. All right, well. <laughs> I need to make it, I need. That's me crumbling up my paper. My notes. <laughs> oh, I do still have. 
Yeah, a real party. Practically everyone who wanted to kill me would be there. Um, <laughs> I love that. And I actually did this, and I don't even like this quote, but I just like the, the turn of phrase. When he's talking to the gatekeeper, and he says, oh gosh, I'm just so ignorant, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Who'd that remind you of? Molly said that. Exactly. I just love that, like, she's just taking after it. I mean, I know we saw it in reverse order, but like, this is her, like, this is like, I just love that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great. I thought that was cute. But yeah, no, I, 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 one of mine you didn't get, so thank you. <laughs> I tried. You did. You almost wiped me out. Uh, in that case, then, what are your thoughts on uh, a Crackpot Theory this week? I still think that Listen to Win is the red herring. I don't think he's actually... Who? Listens to wind. Okay. I don't think he's actually the black council person. And I think, I don't think it's anybody in this group. I think it's going to come up at some point. Hey, Lisa. Yeah. You can't call them a red herring. It's 2024. What's, why is red herring bad? The false flag. How about? Because he's native. I was kidding. Lisa. Oh, Joshua. <laughs> You're the one who said it. I know. I'm saying he's not. Jesus. Calling him an engine, calling him red. Like, you want to go get him some fucking fire water, Liz, or can we like pretend that he's a real human? Joshua, Jesus Christ! I I apologize to every listener <laughs> for her behavior. We promise that she'll do better. You're Please so carry bad. on with your listen. Racist, that's... racist crackpot theory of the week. But that's where I, I don't think it's I don't think it's him. I think it's going to be something else is going to be thrown into the mix. I do like how Rashid is again on their side. Um, yeah. Because he cut kind of faith in it, so I think that's great. Great, but yes, my crackpot theory. Oh goodness gracious! All right, so next week we are doing. What are we doing next week? So forty-two to forty-six. All right, forty-two to forty-six next week. Woohoo! And uh, that is the penultimate chunk. That's the big battle scene, and it's a good. Excited to see. Mm hmm. Beyond that, ready to rock and roll. My goodness gracious. Uh, thank you for this one, honestly, truly. Thank you for. Well, uh, thank you guys so much. And thank you, Lissy. Beyond that, say those chapter numbers one more time 42 to 46. 42 to 46. It's only four chapters. I have a feeling a lot of things is going to happen. 42, 43, 44, 45, five 46. Okay, okay. Oh, it's always fun to point out when your sibling is wrong. But being able to do it publicly on a podcast yes, is even more fun. <laughs> oh, Goodness me. Even when it's the small things in life, friends. Either way, I appreciate y'all. Thanks the most to those wonderful, spectacular, glorified, because they deserve all the glory. Not like glorified, like over, you know. Patreon members. Patreon.com slash the podcast was on fire. Patreon.com slash the podcast was on fire. Hey, let's see if anyone has any like questions or comments or corrections or like how would they get how would they get in touch with us? Podcast was on fire at gmail.com. The podcast was on fire at gmail.com. Oh, that's a great place to talk to people. Thank you guys so much for those combos. Um, also, you know, we don't mind getting bopped on the nose. Like we like to, we always want to do better. So we appreciate those as well. And yeah. beyond that, I just thank you guys so much for uh, listening every week. It means the world. And I do apologize. There were no preserved Russian dongs episode. You can't, you can't bat a thousand every time. <laughs> it is gracious. Life is good. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks so much. All right. Wish luck this weekend. Last time Lissy traveled to San Diego, it was almost very costly. And I mean, like, because... I almost died. <laughs> so she's going to San Diego again just to risk it. And uh, But I'm not driving this time. I'm flying. So there will be no pulmonary embolism. I have my compression socks and everything. You said last time there were going to be no pulmonary embolism. I don't know what the word is. You know, a, a broken clock is right twice a day. I was led to believe you weren't going to have any blood clots in your lungs like most days of my life. So Me too. I am uh, very disappointed in you for that. So let's not do that. Let's, you don't die. 
and let's my, do my, my water polo team win lots of games this weekend. Let's, That'd let's, be awesome. Let's, let's agree to do that. And then um, cross paths again next week when we record yep. this thing. But Heck yeah. Hey, if you're not a Patreon subscriber, you got homework. You got to tell one person alive about the podcast that was on fire. But if you don't, no one's going to check up on you. So, like, fine. Whatever, <laughs> man. Don't be a dick about it. And then Josh. And I am Alyssa. With the podcast was on fire. And it was my fault. Наш фильм. фильм. Его мама. Его мама. Наша жизнь. Наша. Жизнь. Твоя жизнь. Твоя жизнь. Это твоя прошлая жизнь. Прошлая жизнь. Твоя неделя. Твоя неделя. Прошлый. Добрый. Добрый. Прошлый. Где? Вот. Кошка. Твое. Их дело. All right, today we had chapter, the penultimate chunk for Turncoat, which was chapters 34 through 40, 34 through 41? Yep. Does that sound right? Okay, so it's not the penultimate chunk. No, I don't think so. I'm so bad at words and thoughts. and Maybe one day I'll be a real boy. <laughs>